Take your Bibles and go again to the book of Hebrews. We are in our communion service today. And so we have been working through, in Hebrews chapter 1, the uh, phrases that describe our Lord Jesus. And uh, it has been quite interesting uh, as we've done that. Last Sunday, I was in, in, in Indianapolis, and their Sunday evening service was also their communion service last Sunday. So I saw a, a very, it was a, really a wonderful service. And when I finish this series, I'm going to use some of the things they did as a model for an upcoming service. But it won't fit with for what we're doing tonight, or today, this afternoon. Okay, so in our series, we've talked about uh, these ideas. First of all, we've talked about the perfect son. In Hebrews 1, 2, where he says, In these last days he has spoken to us in his son. And so we there we were looking at the the idea of the Son throughout Hebrews as a way of highlighting the unique person of our Savior. And that was a really wonderful service. And then we took that phrase in verse 2 in these last, uh, excuse me, whom he has appointed heir of all things. We talked about what that meant in the place of that. Uh, his uh, work for sinners earned our Lord the right to inherit all the kingdoms of the world and everything in the universe. And then, <clears throat> creator of all things. That was the message uh, a month ago. And w we talked about what it means to have our creator as also our savior. And what the amazing grace God offered in redeeming back creation that seemed to be lost forever. So today, our subject is the radiance of God's glory. And you'll look to verse 3 for that designation. And he is the radiance of of his glory. And our message, uh, that is the title of our message, uh, The Radiance of His Glory Today. We're going to read our whole first paragraph of Hebrews 1 uh, and focus on that one phrase. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. So the first thing I want to say on this uh, phrase is a comment from one of my commentaries, David Allen. He says, the first clause of verse 3 describes the son's relation to the father, demonstrating his qualifications to function as the mediator of revelation. So let's talk a little bit about this comment. Now, what does the word mediator mean? Well, it means somebody who stands between two parties, carrying the message of one back to the other. You think about a trade dispute, and there's the management, and there's the union representatives, and often what happens is that will go to arbitration. The arbitrator is a mediator. So he's, he hears one side, he uh, takes that message, goes to the other side, hears what they are saying, and then they respond back, he takes it back to the other side, and often it helps to have a buffer person in the middle in those type of situations. The same way that a real estate transaction works. The agent is sort of a buffer person in between the middle of the two parties. They can get upset and get angry and blow up and have all kinds of uh, issues. And the mediator just takes it and then he takes on the message and says, well, they didn't like that. <laughs> and, and it takes all the emotion, out, well, mostly out of, the, out of the thing and people can make good decisions. That's the theory, anyway. Well, the mediator. So the action of, of a mediator is to mediate, to be in the middle. Uh, so in the prologue to Hebrews, our, our author says that the Son is the last mediator between God and man. God used prophets, now he speaks through the Son. There is, he stands in between, in a sense, in between the Father and the people. And his unique relationship to the Father is what makes him the perfect mediator or spokesman to man. His message is not simply to tell us more about the Father, but to bring us into communion with the Father when we enter into a relationship with the Son who is the radiance of his glory. So 
So the proposition for our message today is the Son reveals the light of God to you so you may believe his word. I really have a simple message. Probably won't be a very long one. But let's talk first of all about the meaning of radiance. There are many synonyms for radiance in the translations that we have in the English uh, Bible world. So for example, the King James Version and the Young's Literal Translation will give us the brightness of his glory here in this phrase. The American Standard Version uses the word effulgence. That's a little bit harder to understand because, uh, oh, uh, Yvonne, your ride is here. So, all right, so you can help her with that. But anyway, effulgence, what kind of a word is that? That's very hard to understand. But if you listen to the other synonyms, you will know what it means. So uh, another version calls it the outshining uh, uh, of the... The outshining of the... Let me read this again. The outshining of his glory. Another one. The resplendence. The resplendence of his glory. Okay. And, a, and still another says the reflection of his glory. The reflection of his glory. And then finally, uh, uh, one more. There are several others, but these are the, I figured we had enough with synonyms. But this one says the gleaming brightness of his glory. So all these terms have to do with brightness and light coming from a light source. So radiance, uh, the brilliance, the, the brightness, the outshining. All of these terms, effulgence is the one that's hardest to understand. But I think if you think of all the other terms, you'll get the idea of what that word means. So the Greek word, uh, it's only used here in the whole Bible. Uh, there are uh, some competing definitions. It's interesting, the F.F. F. Bruce in his commentary, he used the word effulgence. He is the effulgence or reflection of God's glory. So uh, those two words are actually different. Effulgence is one thing, that is the outshining. Reflection has a different meaning, all right? And uh, there's another uh, lexicon says uh, this word means shining, either in the sense of radiation from a source or the reflection of a source of light. So if you think about the radiation from a source, the sun produces its own light. It just, the light comes out. It's just shining out. Whereas a reflection is like the light of the sun reflected by the moon. We talk about moonlight, but it's actually sunlight. I mean, it's, you know, the moon has no light. It's just a rock. Okay, but it's reflect, it, the light it sends to the earth, and some nights, if you are in a full moon, in a clear night, you walk at night in the middle of the night, big full moon, and, that, the, and the fields are lit up. You think it's almost, it's not quite day, but it's very bright. It can be very bright. Well, that's sunlight. It's not moonlight, it's sunlight. Okay, so that's the idea. So the question is, which one, what does he mean here? Uh, is it the direct light of the Father or the reflected light from the Father? Is that, what does he mean? Well, most church fathers held that the Son is the direct light from the Father, the radiance, and I think that is the right way, right way to take it. Both meanings would be possible according to usage and context, yet patristic consensus uh, says uh, one uh, lexicon, patristic, patristic consensus, that's the church fathers, favors the interpretation that Christ is the effulgence, that word keeps coming up, the radiation of the divine glory as sunshine is of the sun or light of light. Tom Constable says, probably the writer meant that Jesus' glory was like the glory of the sun rather than the glory of the sun that is reflected by the moon. And uh, David Allen says, Jesus <laughs> is the effulgence of God's glory, the radiation of God's glory, because he shares the same divine nature as the Father, yet he is distinct from the Father in his person. So what they're trying to say is this, the sun is this great object in the sky. This isn't a perfect illustration. Okay, it's not a perfect illustration. The sun produces its own light, so there's a sense in which the light of the sun is different from the sun. Do you follow what I'm saying? The light of the sun is not the same thing, same exact thing as the sun, but there it is, it is 
the same light. It's being produced by the sun. Now, obviously, there's no perfect illustration in creation of the relationship between the Father and the Son. But as the Father is light, so He is light. And as, as the Father is glorious, He is the outshining of God's glory. He is the way that God's glory is communicated to us. That's what we mean by using all these synonyms. Brightness, effulgence, radiance. That God's Light, God's glory, is shining to us through Him. They are one and the same in terms of their being, according to the Scriptures, but, it is, but there is a communication between them. Um, I, I keep wanting to say something, and it's not exactly in my notes, but I'll just say it, and it might show up in my notes later. There's a thing that the, that the church fathers worked out in one of the councils, they use the term that he is in eternal procession from the Son. The father, the, he is the Son, he's generated from the Father, but this is an eternal expression of God's nature. So there is these two persons, well three, including the Spirit, and the Father produces eternally the Son. That's why there's two persons and yet one being. Okay, and the same with the Spirit. The Father eternally produces the Spirit. Okay, so three persons, one being. Now, we, we have a really hard time with say, seeing that. We can understand a human father having a human son. We can understand that. They're two different persons, two different beings. But we, we have a real hard time understanding that there is one being who has two persons. But that's the idea that's being communicated with this expression. Okay, so now think about this. Before the incarnation, before the Son came to the earth, the Father shares in the divine glory because He is one with the Father. His, the light of God is the light of the Son. Right? After the incarnation... The Son reveals the divine glory to men because He is the embodied revelation of God's essential glory. Okay, so, uh, and we see the experience of Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration where the glory of God shone through the clothes and the skin and the figure of the, of the Son. And we see the glory of God being revealed in Jesus in that experience. Later on, when you come to Revelation chapter 1, and you see John the Apostle uh, having a vision of the Son, the Son who comes to him, that voice who he, who he knew so well, uh, speaks to him, apparently from behind his back, and calls him, and he turns to see someone who he long looked for, very familiar with, and he turns and he sees this figure where the Son uh, of God is appearing very bright, like molten metal, it's shining, full of light, full of brightness. See, this is the sun reflecting, revealing. He is the radiance of his glory. So in revealing God, he reveals himself, since he is God. And, and he reveals nothing other than God. The Nicene Creed has a way of putting this. And I'm going to read from the Nicene Creed, a quite a lengthy section. I'm going to put it on the screen, and you'll see the phrase eventually when we get through part way through this. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things seen and unseen, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father. They're trying to get to this being idea. God from God, light from light. That's the phrase. Light from light. True God from true God. Begotten, not made. Not created. Doesn't have a beginning. Of the same being as the Father, through whom all things come to be, came to be, both the things in heaven and on earth, who for us humans and for our salvation came down and was made flesh, becoming human, who suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. The Catholic and Apostolic Church condemns those who say concerning the Son of God that there was a time when he was not. Or he did not exist before he was begotten. Or he came to be from nothing. Or 
who claim that he is of another substance or essence or creation or changeable or alterable. And so this is what we're trying to get at with this phrase. And especially in the middle there where he says, God from God, light from light. Light from light. So he is the radiance of his glory. We think of the expressions of God that we, or images of God that we see described in the Bible. We think about Isaiah, who in chapter 6 says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his glory filled the temple. And he falls at his feet. There's just, he's full of light. It's a thing that is beyond description. Uh, and so this is who we are talking about. So since, <clears throat> since the Son is the direct light from the Father, he is eternal. So there's never a moment when light does not emanate from the Father. There's not one moment. God is all glory. He is all light. He is always glorious. There's never a time or a moment when the Father and the Son are separated. He is the, ra he is the radiance of his glory, the outshining of his glory. And so he is eternal. And because he's eternal, he is God. Because only God is eternal. This is the pra pra place in the commentary where David Allen said, each word pulsates with deity. Okay? Each word pulsates with deity. So when we read this, we think about who we're talking about and, and this, this description of our God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the meaning of radiance, the outshining of his glory. All right, and then the effect of his glory. So, for example, the Bible says uh, that thy word is a light or a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. And so when we follow him, he gives us the light we need in order to live our lives. You know, we have lots of questions. We, new events happen in our lives. We uh, go from, uh, from the home where our parents told us what to do, whether we did it or not, uh, and they gave us what wisdom they had, whether it was wise or not, and we sort of followed what they said. All right? But then we were on our own, and we had to make our own decisions. We might call and ask them or some other advisor for some help, but what we, are, what we find that is if, if we will give our hearts and minds to our God and to live uh, our lives in accordance with his word, that he gives light to our paths. He shines before us. He gives us wisdom to make good decisions if we will give our hearts to following him. There are times when he'll lead in very dark places. We may not have many answers. There may not be many good options that are apparent to us. But as we trust him and we trust his words, we can be assured that we have light for our path. He shows us light for our path and he also shows us our light, our way to the Father. This, of course, probably precedes all of it. Perhaps that's the thing that people need more than anything else. They need for their way to be enlightened as they seek to find answers for this life and all of life's problems. They need a way to the Father, and the Son reveals that way. The Son is also a spotlight on my own darkness. In His light, my sin stands exposed. So light, the darkness does not like the light because the light exposes the darkness. But here's the thing. That darkness, when, we are, when our darkness is exposed, we now have the opportunity to confess. And by his light, my sin can be purged. They will use light to, uh, to treat some illnesses and some wounds. Right? It can purge. Just as fire can cauterize a wound, so the light of the sun can purge the sin that is in your life. So the effect of his glory puts us into a right relationship to him. He is a lamp to my feet. He is a spotlight to my darkness. And he is a beacon in the darkness. He is the bright and morning star. He is, he is the one by which we can navigate throughout life's trials and troubles. He is the one that we can follow. And the light of the world to come. Uh, uh, the, uh, as we look to him... As we follow him, we have a hope that we will 
come one day to that place where there is no need of the sun and no need of the moon because the sun is the light of that city. And that is the place of light. There is no night there, the book of Revelation tells us. Now, we don't know exactly what all of that means. I'm looking forward to finding out myself. The effect of his glory. He is the radiance of the Father. The Son reveals the light of God to you, so you may believe his word. He enlightens your mind. He fills your heart with light if you give yourself to him. And I hope you have. By the virtue of his death on the cross, he has made himself the way, the light uh, for our pathway to lead us to God. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time that we've had today to consider your word and your son. And Lord, I pray that as we worship you now with the communion service, that our hearts would be full of light. Lord, we pray that each one here, we pray especially for our young people, that they would be fully committed to following you no matter what. Lord, we know that every one of us are faced with all kinds of decisions and we sometimes make mistakes and we don't always make the right choices. But Lord, I pray that our young people, our older people, our ancient people would all follow the light of the word and walk with you in everything we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.